So let me jump into this real quick. Uh, so, so I have this tool belt on. It is, it is ridiculous what I'm trying to do with this thing. But let me tell you this. My friend Nate Harris, who does our kids' check-in, you all know the bearded, the bearded guy that's at kids' check-in? Like, he looks like he can murder you. Anybody here? Yeah, like, he looks like, looks like he got out of prison last week. You all know who I'm talking about? We call him Prison Nate, all right? No. He, I love Nate. He's amazing. He's one of the kindest, most gentle, incredible human beings who looks like if you mess with our kids, he would break you in half. I love that, okay? Like, that's what I want. I don't need somebody soft out there. I need somebody who looks like he could suplex you out there to protect our children, right? Because that's the world we live in. And, and so Nate's out there, but Nate not only is incredible in our kids' ministry, but Nate is a contractor Monday through Friday. So Nate uses things like this, and he shows up at job sites, and he builds, and he works, and he does stuff, and all the fun things that you need. And one day, him and I were working on a project together, and he needed to do something, and he said, oh, I have the perfect tool for this moment. And he runs out, and he gets this thing right here, okay? Anybody know what this is? Oh, somebody knows. It's called a multi-tool. I had no idea. I'm like, what kind of voodoo are you pulling out on me right now? He's like, check this out. Ooh, God, I feel the power when I did that. I feel like He-Man. I have the power. Some of y'all don't get that 80s reference. Um, and, and, and so he pulls this out and he does whatever he does with it, right? And he said this. He goes, dude, I went to the store hundreds of times and passed this tool up. Hundreds of times I would walk by it. I would not think twice of it. I thought, who wastes their money on this tool right here? This is the dumbest looking tool I've ever seen. And he says, one day I decided to get one for one very small job I had. I thought it would work. I picked it up. I ended up using it. And he said this, from the moment it, I used it for the first time, I realized even though I never thought I needed it, I can't live without it any longer. He says he uses this tool every single day on the job site. I plan on not giving it back to him just to mess with him all week, just so you know. Don't tell him. <laughs> I'm going to lose it. The point is he went from something he thought he never needed to something that he can't live without. And I wonder how many of us, there's some spiritual tools that God wants to show us today and through the next five or six weeks that you didn't realize you needed but now you're going to learn you cannot live without. And my prayer is as we go on this journey and you look at these five behaviors and these five tools that you would evaluate, hey, God, this requires me to purchase this tool, which might mean it's going to cost me something to get it. God, it might not be as easy or as comfortable. I'm going to have to learn how to use it. I never used a tool like this before, so now my hands have to understand and I have to create a muscle memory on how this tool works. But then, God, I'm going to use that tool to build the very things that you are wanting to build in my life. It requires me to acquire it. I have to first purchase it and get it. I have to put it in my tool belt. But then I also then have to learn how to use it. And today, what I want to do is cast kind of a big picture of what we're talking about, what it means to have a transformative gospel happen in our lives, and go from a transformative gospel to say, hey, God, I'm going to let the gospel actually transform me. Uh, raise your hand if you're with me on this. Who here wouldn't mind a better life? If your hand's not raised, you're a liar. That's okay. You're in the right place. Because God likes to help liars not be liars anymore. We all want a better life. We all are looking for the thing to make our life better. But here's what I would propose to you as a follower of Jesus. To have a better life, it is you realizing that you have to lay yourself down and say, I'm going to pick up Jesus' ways, no longer living for my ways. The transformative gospel is a better life through becoming more like Jesus. It is becoming more like Jesus. You will not get the better life you're seeking after if you're not willing to become more like Jesus. And the question we have to ask is, how? How do I actually become more like him? Well, I've got these five behaviors, these five tools that over the next five weeks we're going to be camping in and looking at and saying, God, how do we really do this the way that you want us to do it? So they're going to throw up some icons for you. I'm going to walk through them. The number one, and, and these are not in any order of more importance than others. It's just all five of these need to get in your tool belt if you're going to really build something that God wants to do and you want a transformed life. The first one is this. You've got to learn how to study your Bible. 
You have to learn how to read your Bible. Most data goes out and tells us that majority of followers of Jesus do not read their Bible. It's interesting. How will you ever know the God that you say you follow if you don't know what he actually said? There are too many people being tricked by TikTok prophets. Can I get an amen? amen. There's too, listen, they did a survey one time where it was Taylor Swift lyrics or the gospel, and most Christians got them wrong. They thought Taylor Swift lyrics was the Bible. Oof. Don't get me wrong. I like a little Swifty time, but that is not okay. We are not here to be tricked. If you're going to know who God is, you've got to get in his word and study his word and recognize who he is. Because when all hell is breaking out in your life, you better learn how to stand on the word of God. The Bible says put the word deep inside of your heart. You've got to know it. And it's alarming to me how many of us want to take someone else's revelation, someone else's teaching, someone else's work, and we just simply want to say, well, I've heard the Bible. But my friend, I want to tell you, you've got to learn how to study the Bible. You've got to learn how to know it. The, the reason why people get tricked into cults is because they allow the personality and the charisma of the person to supersede what the word really says you need in your life. And, and, and when you're dealing with somebody who's a counterfeit or you're dealing with a situation that does not line up with the word, if you know it, you're able to have this moment where you say, that's not the intent or the heart of the word of God. And this person might be leading people astray. And it's important for you to say, I am going to be a studier and a reader and a consumer of the word. Very quickly, just to build my argument just a little bit more for it. The FBI, when they train FBI agents when it comes to counterfeit currency, you know, there's over 10,000 counterfeit currencies of a U.S. dollar. So when they're looking at a U.S. dollar, there's over 10,000 unique counterfeits out there. Instead of wasting an FBI agent's time on teaching them all 10,000 versions of counterfeit dollars, what they do is they teach them the ins and outs of a real American dollar, what it looks like to be authentic and real. So then they can always recognize when a counterfeit is in front of them. And you will never be able to do that unless you get in the word of God. Amen? Amen. Second thing I want you to know is a key tool that you need in your tool belt is you've got to understand what it looks like to have prayer and worship be a daily part of your life. You've got to be willing to sit there and say, God, I'm going to ask for the presence of you to be in me right now. God, I want to spend time not just reading the word, even though it's great to read the word, it's great to study the word, but not just study it and have all the head knowledge. God, I need the heart knowledge of the presence of God in my life through prayer and worship. Sometimes that means I put on music and worship. Sometimes that means I just sit quietly in the presence of God and allow him to speak to my soul. But we need to speak. Spend time daily in the presence of God. It is not just if the song's right on a Sunday and I like it, I might just get into it. It's saying, uh, God, I don't know what's going on right now. There's some chaos in the world around me. There's some things I don't fully understand. But instead of me worrying about all of my problems, I'm going to spend my time worshiping you instead of worrying about the situation. Amen? Amen. <laughs> You're like, mm, I don't want to do that. Worry is so much easier. Just remember Jesus said it like this. Worry will not add anything to your life. You know how I know that? Because I study the word of God. And, 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 I, and I, listen, this, this morning alone, okay, Stephanie comes early because she's part of the worship team. I have to get our three feral children ready most Sundays. <laughs> and I have to prepare them. And my youngest is at the point now where he wants to be in the bathroom by himself every time he uses the bathroom, which is fine. I don't really want to be in there with him. But, you know, he's still three and he needs some help. And I can recognize when he's in there too long, it's not because he's using the bathroom. He's trying to destroy the toilet somehow while he's in the bathroom, like a prisoner trying to escape from a prison, okay? I, oh, I, I opened the door this morning because he was in there too long, and I go, Lincoln, what are you doing right now? He said, oh, I can't get the toilet to flush. Why? Now, I think I understand how a toilet works. He has left some friends in the toilet, he dropped some kids off at the pool, if you know what I'm talking about. And I'm like, oh, Lord Jesus, help me. And I'm trying to work through this, and the toilet won't flush. So now I have some turds in the toilet. The toilet won't flush. Lincoln has got his just laughing, having a good time. 
And I'm trying everything. For 30 minutes this morning, I'm trying everything. And I'm realizing more and more why there are some people who do just say, like, you know, there are some mammals that eat their young. There's a reason why, because they just take you to a place, right? And I'm like, dude, what did you do to this toilet? Nothing, nothing. Finally, he turned the water off at the, uh, at the toilet. <laughs> turned the water off. Little turkey. Can I tell you, I know all the scriptures that you can quote. In that moment, as I am trying to keep my Sunday face on, you know what I'm talking about, and I'm trying to keep my stuff together, and I'm trying to be ready to preach to you, and I'm trying to be a good dad, I know scripture, but I also need to invite the presence of God into those moments. Where I have to say, God, I don't know why this child is doing the things he's doing, but you love this child, and you gave me this child to steward, and I will not murder this child because it's your child, and I need your presence to fill my heart. Can I get an amen? It's got to be a parent in the room who can testify. I need a tool in my tool belt of the presence of God. Because there's t- you don't need the presence of God when everything's going good in your life, folks. You don't need it when, when, you need it when you're like, hey, God, I need this tool to come out right now. And I need to spend time with you because I need you right now in my life. And there's many of us who don't have this tool in our tool belt. And we wonder why we quickly go to external things to solve our problems instead of looking deep on the internal of what's going on inside of our souls. The next one is this. I want to encourage you that you need to serve. Serving is a key component of a disciple of Jesus. It is a tool that needs to be in your tool belt. If you struggle with pride and you deal with arrogance or an ego, you think the world revolves around you, the only antidote to that sickness is learning how to serve others' needs over your needs. You will not fix the antidote of selfishness with more selfishness. You've got to learn, and the Bible says it like this, that God resists the proud, resists those with an ego, resists those who are selfish, but gives grace or unmerited favor to those that are humble. You want God's grace and favor on your life? Learn how to be humble. How do you become humble? You think less of yourself and you help other people around you. You walk around your workplace and your schools and your communities with the eyes of Jesus looking to serve, not to be served. And you watch that tool transform your life. God wants to build something with you and it's going to require some humility on your end. To say, God, I'm going to choose others over myself. Amen. And the fourth tool, the fourth behavior that we're going to look at over the next five weeks is generosity. Now, this is when it gets uncomfortable. It's generosity. John 3.16, most iconic scripture out there. God so loved the world that he, anybody know the next word? One word. God so loved the world that he? Notice the very character of God is generosity. The very behavior of God is generosity. God so loved us that he gave. And we want to call ourselves Christians in this American ideology, this idea of Christianity, but yet be stingy and selfish and act like all the wealth that we have is ours. Well, I earned it. That's mine. That's my truck. That's my house. That's my clothes. That's my bank account. Jesus talked more about money than heaven, hell, and love combined. Why? Because he said it clearly. If you show me where you invest in your treasure, I'll show you where your heart is. And there's too many of us that if we look at our bank accounts, we can see very clearly. It does not show that God is building anything in our bank accounts. Because we don't use it as a tool to help others and to show a world a generous gospel. We are selfish in consuming more and more, thinking it will satisfy something broken on the inside of us. That new truck will be nice for about 30 days until you get the payment, my friend. It's going to be cute for 30 days. That new pair of shoes is going to make you feel good for a moment. And there's nothing wrong with new things. I'm not here to beat you up over new things. I'm just saying it is very dangerous when you don't have possessions any longer, but possessions got you. And you're obsessed with getting and getting and getting instead of giving and giving and giving. I want to encourage you. Learn the tool of generosity over the next five weeks. Learn how to say, God, you want to use what little you've given me to build your kingdom And to see it grow. And God, your word even says that I can't outgive you. So now, why am I holding on? See, the reason why we don't give God our finances, it's not because we don't have enough. It's because we don't have enough trust in him that he'll provide. If we had enough trust in him that he would provide, we'd give it all. 
But because we don't trust him enough that he'll provide, we refuse to because we're afraid that if he doesn't show up, then we're going to be left holding the bag. And I'm here to encourage you. Go on this wild journey of real Christianity where you say, God, I want to know your word. I want to know who you are. God, I want to serve a broken community. God, I want your presence daily. God, I want to look for opportunities to be generous. And God, listen, I want to fellowship with other believers. I want to fellowship with other believers. Believers, see, this is one of the most underused muscles in the American church. We have this John Wayne complex where we're like, it's me against the world. I, I've got this. I'm going to just take care of myself, pull myself up by my bootstraps. And we isolate. And the devil's very clear. It says this in the word that he is like a lion seeking who he can devour. How do lions hunt? They don't hunt the middle of the pack. They see who's isolated from the pack. The reason why we're so much better together is because when we're together and we have godly mentors and fellowship and people who are helping us, we are able to overcome the enemy in our life. If you think you can do it on your own, good luck. I know I can't. Anybody in here have a blind spot? Would you just raise your hand if you've got a blind spot? If you're not raising your hand, I, you can now raise your hand because you have a blind spot. We all have blind spots where we don't see things as well as someone else sees it in us. And we've got to have some godly fellowship of people who know us well enough to say no, know us well enough to encourage us, know us well enough to strength, to, to, to really we take the mask off with, and they help us get closer to Jesus. I always say you know you have really godly fellowship with somebody when you leave their presence and you feel closer to God after being with them. That's really godly fellowship right there. And they encourage you to do more of what God has called you to do. We need this so badly. These five behaviors are these five tools. Here's what I think. I personally think you never knew you needed them until you got them. You never knew you needed them until you got them. And once you get them, my prayer is this, you won't take them off your tool belt. That you'll pull them out every day and say, you know what? I need this tool now. I need this tool now. I need, as God is building something in me every day. Every day I go to work, there's things that God's building in me. Every day when I show up at school, God's building things in me. Every day my kid turns off the water and leaves a turd in the toilet, God's building something in me. You with me? Every day God is trying to build something in me. Am I going to destroy what he's building or am I going to add to what he's building? Am I gonna am I gonna add to it with the tools that he wants to give me, but I gotta acquire them. I gotta get them. I gotta pay a cost for them. And then once I've got them, I gotta learn how to use them. And I'm gonna train you on how to use them over the next five weeks. And I'm gonna give you very clear application on each one of them, how you can get started. And as you do this, give it time. Don't rush it. And watch what God will build. I'm gonna finish with this. Hebrews chapter 13. If I was on a desert island and I, I couldn't take the whole Bible and I can only take one chapter of the Bible with me to get me through a desert island experience, it'd be Hebrews chapter 13. Verse number seven says it like this. As you endure, which means a long time, divine discipline. Ooh, what a, what a combo right there. That's a preacherism right there. Somebody's getting some divine discipline. Remember that God is treating you as his own child. Whoever heard of a child who never got disciplined by its father? Verse number eight. If God doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, you know what it means? It means you are illegitimate and not really his child at all. Dang, that felt like somebody just spanked me in the butt when I read that scripture. If you're walking around saying, you know what, I got to be honest with you. Doug, I don't really ever feel like God's ever challenging me. God's not really ever pushing me. God's not really ever making me feel like there's more for me out there. Well, my friend, I want you to beware because you might be more illegitimate than you think. And how do you become legitimate? You say a prayer of humility and you surrender your life and say, God, from this day on, I want to be your child for real. Show me your ways. Show me how to follow you. Believe me, he will, in a very small voice, begin to whisper to your heart through his word how you surrender your life. But then it goes on to say this. Since we respect our earthly fathers who discipline us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of our Father of our Spirit who lives forever. Submit even more. See, if, if we're all a seed, a seed doesn't produce a harvest and grow to what it's called to be until it gets buried into the ground and surrenders itself to the tree it wants to become. It can't stay a seed forever. 
You can't stay a baby Christian forever just showing up on Sunday mornings hoping you get enough for the whole week. You've got to learn how to say, I'm going to surrender and submit because God, and through my submission, will grow me more than where I'd be if I just keep holding on. Some of us were just holding on to everything we knew in the past. And God's like, would you submit to the process because there's more out there if you submit to it. Verse number 10 says this, for our earthly father disciplines us for a few years, doing the very best they know how. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. Know this, when God is disciplining you, it's not because he wants to pick on you. It's not because he wants to bully you. It's not because he wants to make your life harder. He's doing it because there's a better out there. There is more out there than what you currently have, and he wants to give it to you. Go back to transformative gospel. You want to be better? You do it by saying, I want to be more like Jesus. I will die to myself, and the better will come as I become more like him. See, it says this in verse 11, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. Can I get an amen? amen. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful, but afterwards there is a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained. Somebody say trained. In this way. There is a harvest for those of us who are willing to, to be trained. What does that tell me? That tells me you wouldn't know this naturally without somebody training you. If you trust us for the next five weeks, I'm going to do everything I can to train you in the ways of Jesus. The disciple, uh, b disciple means discipline once. The behaviors of a disciple. I want to train you. I want to equip you. I want to help you. But you've got to be willing to show up to get it. You can't just be like, oh, I just hope it all it gives me when I said yes to Jesus. No, you've got to be trained, which means you didn't know it ahead of time. you got to learn it. And it goes on to say this, and I'm done with this, verse 12 and 13. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weakened knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so those who are weak and lame will not fall, but they will become strong. Can I say this? You getting a new grip with your tired hands and you standing strong with your shaky legs, I get it. Life has been beating you up and you're just hanging on for dear life. But it's not just for you. It's not just so that you get all the good things that God has for you. It says because there will be those after you who will see the path you set and they will follow your example. I'm not just a follower of Jesus for Doug. I'm a follower of Jesus for those three boys that I'm raising right now. I'm a follower of Jesus for you to say, man, if my pastor, who all hell has broken out in his life, the devil tried to rob him, steal him, and control him. The devil wanted him to be dead and still standing, worshiping God. Why can't I stand and worship God? You are not at your workplace by accident, my friend. You are not in your school system by accident, my friend. You are not where you are by accident. It's so that you can stand strong with the divine discipline that God has given you. And as you walk it out, people are going to say, I'll follow where they're going right now. Christianity is not a crutch. It's not weakness. It's meant to lead the world towards God. But we have to be willing to pay the price to get there. We have to be willing to say, God, at all costs, I will be a disciple of yours. Train me. Give me the tools. Give me the weapons. Give me what I need. And God, I'll wage war against an enemy in my life. And I will help others find hope for their new possible as well. I'm going to leave you with this question. This is it. I'm going to be done with this. I got I to get off stage. I could do this for two more hours, but I got to get off stage. I got a question for you to process this week, and I want you to pray this prayer. Here's what I want you to ask God. Seriously, don't just do it with me right now. Do it on your own time. God, is there more for me? Is there more for me? Is there more for me? And if there is, let's go on this journey together. And let's see which one of these tools maybe we haven't used or we don't know how to use and we haven't trusted God's training for. And what areas are we not willing to give to God that we're realizing, i got to surrender this area to God. You know, uh, I don't know what it is for you, but I know this. If you let God, he will show you, he'll give you, he'll speak to you, he'll give you some divine discipline. 
And it shows not that he's mad at you. It shows how much he freaking loves you. It shows how much he's obsessed with you. That he refuses to leave you how he found you, church. And too many of us are just saying, I'm just showing up, getting through this thing. And I'm here to tell you, it's time for more. And it's going to be good, but you've got to let it do its work. And watch what God will do. Is there more? It's a prayer I'm praying all week. Let's pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person to ask this question. God, there, is there more? Is there more for me? Is there more for what you've called us to? Is there more for my life? Is there more for my family? Is there more for my Christianity? Am I just giving you the bare minimum or are you asking for more? And God, I pray, Lord, that we take a deep dive over the next five weeks on these disciples, these behaviors. And as we look at these different ways of following you, God, would your conviction of your Holy Spirit just rest on us, God? Would it just challenge us to surrender more of our life to be more of your life? And that, God, that we would have the better life as we learn to be more like Jesus. God, let that be the transformative gospel that happens in our lives. Help us be more like you. Hey, with your head bowed and eye closed, if you're here and you don't know this Jesus that I'm talking about, you're hearing all this, but you've never had that moment where you said yes to him. Or maybe you did a long, long time ago, but you've drifted from him and you realize I've not been following God, but I need to follow God. The Bible is clear. If you confess with your mouth and you believe with your heart that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. So I want to give you an opportunity to have a fresh start today. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you down front, but I do want to pray with you. So I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, if that's you and you want to say yes to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to lift your hands. See, lifting your hand is the international sign of surrender. When you don't speak the same language as your enemy, you lift your hands when you surrender. And you might be saying, wait a minute, I thought you said God loved me. He does. But our sin separated us from God's love. And, it, and Jesus showed up on the cross, died for our sins, and made a way where there was no way. He became a bridge to get us back to God where we can have a relationship with him again. So this is how we all start our journey, by simply saying yes to the ways of God and bringing him into our hearts. So if that's you... Don't let fear paralyze you, but let your faith have movement and lift up your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I do want to pray with you. When I get to three, shoot up your hands. One, two, three. Shoot them up right now. Hey, hands are going up all over the room. Keep it up just for a moment, please. I have some volunteers that are moving through the room. We want to give you a gift. We want to help you go from a one-time decision to a lifetime disciple. So just keep your hand raised until you receive that gift, and we want to help you on this journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do me a favor. Once you get that gift... Put your hand right on your heart. Do you feel it beating? God is not done with you yet. He's got a plan for you. It will blow your mind. Just trust him and let's go on this journey together. You're in the right series at the right time here at Rust City. So would everyone in the room pray with me, with these people who are saying yes to Jesus, would everyone repeat after me this simple yet significant prayer? Dear Jesus, I ask you to be Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin. Give me a fresh start. I confess that I need you and I make you Lord. Teach me how to follow you all the days of my life. In your name I pray. Amen.